Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon, and then I post this stuff up to YouTube, no, Facebook, Patreon, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I'd like to thank my sponsor, BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. They're an online therapy company. They are international. I have been getting phenomenal feedback from people using them. So thank you, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. Okay. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka done. Okay, so um, current events. So I was reading in the AP today that there was an online blogger that was handing out parental advice that apparently had been torturing her own children. And she basically said in one of the videos that they caught her talking on is that um, she refused to feed a demon. So one of her children was found by a neighbor. They called the police. They were able to get all the kids out, but apparently this blogger was pretty popular. So you know, do your research, figure out who these people are before you listen to them. And if they have the background to be giving said advice, that really just, oh, makes my head hurt. Because it is, it's just, I have dealt with either directly or indirectly so many instances of especially communal narcissists using religion to justify abusing the children. And generally the line that they pull, and this is exactly what this female blogger did. I, you know, I should pull it up. It's on the AP. Um, John, can you find that article? Pretty please, sweetheart, darling, love of my life. Magically on the AP. <laughs> it was, it should be there. It's one of the headlines. Um, but, and I can't remember her name or anything because I was just kind of browsing and looking at things that are relevant. And that's relevant because communal narcissists use the religion, whatever the religion is. It could be Buddhism. It could be Christianity. It could be Islam. It could be, you know, whatever to justify the abuse of the spouse and or the children. And so this woman used her religion as a justification to beat them, starve them. And her thing was, is that she was beating the evil out of them. And she made them apologize repeatedly for the supposed sins that they had done. And she apparently had this partner that was a partner blogger of hers that had basically probably communal narcissist convinced her that this was the way to save the children, which makes no sense. So um, basically if you are, <laughs> with someone who is claiming that they're speaking for God or that God is speaking through them and that God's telling them to starve the children or beat them or harm them in any way, shape or form, run, do not walk to the nearest exit, swear to God and all that's holy, because those people, those people ain't working on the side of light. I'll tell you that much. They ain't, they ain't working for God. Don't know who the hell they're working for. Well, actually I do know who the hell they're working for. You know what I'm saying? So um, the point being is is that communal narcissists do these horrible things. So next week, I want to talk more about cults and communal narcissists because this that really just mm, really made me very angry. And the little boy that the neighbors rescued, first of all, was starving. Second of all, said he brought it on himself. Oh, I did this to my, I was bad. I was wrong. I was, and he had wounds all over him. I'm like, what sane person would do that to their own children? Well, no sane person quite frankly. So um, anyway, it just, I want to talk more about cults next week. So we're going to, we're going to dive into that. But I just thought that was in this day and age, I just, I, I, the number of times I have had to deal with communal narcissists that maybe not a, were a cult in that, you know, they weren't like a big cult or anything, but remember narcissists are a cult of one. And they come up with these crazy ideas to justify their abuse. So mm, be very careful of anyone who hurts anyone and then claims to do it in the name of God or in the name of their religion or in the name of whatever. So we're going to talk more about that next week. All right. Anyway, that's my current event. I just, <sighs> sometimes I go, Chris, you know what? You probably don't want to read the news. You just, you shouldn't. It just, but then again, it's like, <sighs> it's stuff we need to know. So anyway, 
There that is. All right. So today's topic is parental alienation and healing from parental alienation. So first of all, what is parental alienation? So parental alienation is when a disordered individual, and it can be either parent, could be the mom, could be the dad, doesn't matter, either sex, doesn't matter, um, decides that they want to be right and they need to win. And you got to remember when you are dealing with a narcissist or a psychopath or a dark triad, which is a narcissist, psychopath and control freak, winning is the ultimate goal and destroying the person that is not playing their game is also their ultimate goal. And what better way to do that than to turn the kids against the other parent? I just, I think I, I just, oh, God, I hate those people. Anyway, the point being is that mm, they do that and and they don't care about the kids. And, and uh, okay, deep breath, Chris, deep breath. So what they do is the parent, the, okay, so the, the couple gets together. One is a narcissist, okay? The other person figures it out and goes, I'm leaving. And the narcissist then goes on a scorched earth policy, which means they are going to try to turn everyone against the good parent or the saner parent. Okay. That means kids included. That means grandma, grandpa, parents, the whole thing. Okay. Now healthy people don't fall for it. Healthy people see what's going on and are like, you all kinds of crazy and none of it good, you know, and they don't do the siding with the aggressor. However, ego defense, let's talk about this. So ego defense, kids don't have the ability, the emotional cognitive ability to be able to step out of the situation and go, wow, mom and or dad, whoever is doing this is crazy. They, they can't, they just, they don't. Okay. Because their identity is very much wrapped up in the family union. We haven't developed that separation yet to know that, okay, well, I don't, I don't need them. It's it's fine. I can go off on my own. Do you see where I'm going with that? So little kids, even teenagers, don't have the ability to be able to separate from the abuser. So what they do is, is they side with the aggressive parent, kind of take on traits of them, kind of become them in a way, in order to stay safe. It is a basic survival technique. So I've had a lot of parents go get angry at their kids for siding with the aggressor. And I have to explain to them, it's like, this is not a wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm going to turn against dad. Oh, I'm going to turn against mom. No, 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 no. This is deep. This is survival. This is not even really a conscious thought. This is how do I stay safe in this insane situation? So it's clear with an abuser that they will punish the kid for loving the sane parent. That's what abusers do. So, so parental alienation starts long before the divorce, long before the divorce. So, you know, I used to say, and I'm going to stop saying it now because listen to me now, believe me now, don't, don't wait for later. Believe me now. I've had so many clients go, I didn't want to believe you when I tell them that the abuser started the parental alienation long before the divorce. They're like, oh, but they would never do that. Yeah, they would. Listen to me. Believe me. I've done this for how many years now? Oh, my God. They will do and say whatever it takes. They're, they do not know. There is no depth to their depravity. Let's just put it that way. They will say and do whatever it takes. It doesn't matter who they hurt. They don't care who the collateral damage is. They literally don't care about the kids because there's so much research showing how much damage parental alienation does. Ugh. So what the abuser does is that implicitly or explicitly, they let the kids know that they are not to like the other parent. So that... <laughs> That means explicitly they talk bad about the other parent. They call them names. They project all of their stuff onto the good parent and they expect the kids to agree with them. And the kids out of fear start agreeing with them and start hating the other parent. And what's happening is transference. I know lots of psychological terms. I'll try to explain this the best I can. So when a child really hates one parent, 
but it's not safe. They can't go to that parent and go, you douchebag. They can't do that, right? Because they'll smack them. They'll punish them. They'll, you know, cut them off. They'll do whatever. Okay. So they have hatred towards the abuser, but they can't say anything. So they take it out on the safer target because they know that good parent is not going to abandon them, is not going to punish them, like, you know, really punish, like not just, hey, go to your room. You're being disrespectful. The way an abuser punishes is to hit, to harm, to hurt, to you know, just, oh, they go for the jugular. Anyway, um, so, th so they take it out on the safer parent, okay? These douchebags, these abusers have started the parental alienation long before the divorce. They're prime in the pump because they know at some point the spouse is going to figure them out and want out of the relationship. Okay. So that's, <laughs> that's a whole other story anyway. So they start priming the pump and they start saying snarky little things about the other parent, you know, in front of the kids loud enough that the kids can hear. In fact, it's intentional. Let's just, you know, go to brass tacks here. Everything a narcissist does is with an intention. It's with an agenda. They know exactly what they're doing. Stop making excuses for them. They are going to be depraved. They are absolutely, they have no sense of moral compass and they don't give a flying rat's ass about the kids. They just don't. If they did, they wouldn't play these toxic, messed up head games. Oh, you can tell I'm a little passionate about that because it's like the kids don't deserve this. The kids don't deserve this. The spouse doesn't deserve, nobody deserves. You know, I would really love it if they would just all disappear. That would make me so happy. And then I could run an Airbnb somewhere and make breakfast for people on a beach. And oh, God, these freaking abusers just piss me off, especially when they go after kids. So, okay. So back to what it is. So they turn the kid against them. And this has started long before the divorce. So this is another one of those, listen to me now, believe me now statements. I'm not going to say, believe me later, believe me right the hell now. You know, it's like, listen, I'm not making this stuff up. If <laughs> Why would I? Um, so, Cause believe me, I'd rather be on a beach making breakfast for people in a B and B. That's really what I'd like to do. But anyway, therapy in therapy in. There we go. That's the name of my Airbnb. That'd be great. I'd love to do that. Anyway, point, sorry, went to my happy spot. Anyway, um, the point being is this starts long before you must get the kids into therapy with a damn good trauma therapist as soon as you possibly can. Okay. If there's problems in the home, oh, we're working on self-esteem and anxiety. That's all you need to tell the spouse because otherwise they'll prevent them from going to a therapist because they don't want to be found out. That's why they hate therapists because the good ones can, the good ones can look at them and go, <laughs> I know exactly what you are. So anyway, the point being is get them into therapy, make an excuse, make it sound reasonable to the abuser that, oh, they need therapy for anxiety or they need therapy for whatever. And they'll try to stop it. Guarantee you. I mean, if you read my book, what's wrong with your dad, he found out I was in therapy. Ooh, where is it? There it is. Uh, he found out I was in therapy and made me quit because he didn't want to be found out. So <laughs> truth comes out no matter what. Anyway, um, the point being is, is that you need to get them into therapy now with a damn good trauma therapist. Okay. The ex doesn't need to know it's for the impending divorce, which could be years away, but you need to get them into a therapist that they have a safe place to express to and that the ex is not going to be interfering. Now, if, if there are any therapists out there listening to me or any student therapists listening to me, the number one thing that pisses me off more than anything is that they cave, the therapist cave to the abuser because they're afraid of the abuser because guess what they're doing? Siding with the aggressor because they haven't worked on their own stuff. So the aggressor will come in and demand to know everything that's being talked about in therapy. A good therapist will say, I will let you know if there is something you need to know like danger to self, danger to other. Otherwise, there needs to be privacy so that they feel free to speak. And that usually stops it, believe it or not. You know, a lot of them don't push past that because they think, you know, oh, I can't push past that. Okay, oh, you know. So you lay out the law 
right then and there. It's like the kid needs privacy. If the kid is not able to have privacy and speak their mind for the fear that the abuser is going to find out about what they're saying, they're not going to open up. They're going to sit in that session and be like, mm -hmm, make me talk, especially the teenagers. Oh my God. Anyway, so get them into a good trauma therapist. Now, if you've waited until the divorce is Ah, noise things must turn off noise. Hold on. There we go. Um, if you've waited until the divorce has started, you still get them into a good trauma therapist. And your excuse this time is they need help dealing with the trauma of the divorce. That's it. You know, they don't need to know. They need help dealing with the trauma of you as an abuser. But it'll, it'll honestly, if they have a good therapist, the therapist will figure it out, especially if they're well-versed in high-conflict divorces high conflict custody. So the kids are used as a pawn by the abuser because the narcissist is all about the win. They have to win at literally all costs. They do not care about the kid and they will say, oh, but I care so much about my child. Oh, but I care so much about them. Well, if you cared so much about them, why are you calling your spouse a bastard and a bitch and this and that and the other thing. It's like, uh, 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 no, 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 no. Because that kid is half of them too. And they will take that personally because kids don't have the ability to discern that this is a bigger issue than them. Because remember, kids are very egocentric, but not egocentric in the way that narcissists are. Kids are very egocentric as in it's all them. Oh my God, it's my fault. Oh my God. I thought something mean about grandma and then she had a stroke. It's my fault. That's literally magic thinking. That is literally how kids think until about mm, teenage years and even sometimes then. So it's really important that <laughs> you nip this stuff in the bud as soon as you hear it or see it. So they'll start this stuff before the divorce. They'll say snarky things about you in front of you, in front of the kids, you know, They'll try to have arguments in front of the kids. You do not want that. The kids don't need to hear this adult stuff. It's not their problem. Their problem is to navigate how to be a kid in the 22nd, 1st century, whatever we're in. Technology, fucking hate technology. Anyway, so the point being, I know I'm swearing all over the place, really shouldn't be. Anyway, the point being is, is that they will start this stuff long before the divorce. And because a lot of us are in denial, you know, we're, we're, oh, excusing it or justifying it or, oh, it's not that bad. No, it is that bad. Don't justify it. Don't excuse it. Do something. So it's going to be a matter of protecting your kids. <clears throat> so they've turned the kid against you. They've lied. They've lied about you. They outright will lie. They will blame you for everything that they're doing. hundred percent. Oh, well, your father, you know, did this, that, and the other thing. Oh, well, your mother did this, that, and the other thing. When in reality, it's the abuser that did this, that, and the other thing. And then the kids are stuck in the middle because they know that if they show love for the kind parent, the good parent, the sane parent, that the abuser is going to beat them down emotionally, physically, religiously, ecumenically, whatever. Do you see where I'm going with that? So you've got to start nipping that stuff in the bud you got to start calling it out. It's like saying people don't talk that way about the, you know, father or mother of their child, period. I would never say something like that about your other parent, period, because that's not cool, period. Do you see where I'm going? You can call this stuff out without point blank going, oh, well, you know, your father, your mother is a total narcissist. You don't ever want to do that. But what you want to do is start calling out the behavior. And you want to start calling out that it's not normal. You don't want to normalize it. This is the big problem is that this kind of nastiness has been normalized in the abusive relationship, in the abusive toxicity of that family union. And you want to start breaking that up and off and up and making it clear that this is not normal behavior. So what can you do? So the kids have been slowly poisoned against you. Okay, well, hopefully you will have them in therapy. Now, here's the reason, another reason why you want to get them in therapy before the divorce. If they're in therapy before the divorce, you make it part of the divorce decree, and you're going to do that anyway, that the kids get therapy. Okay, no judge is going to deny that. They're, if, the, if the other parent comes out, well, I don't want them in therapy. Why not? You know, the judge is going to be like, no, they get therapy but it's harder for the opposing parent, the crazy parent to pull them out of therapy if they're already in therapy. Okay. See where I'm going with that, especially if it's court ordered. So you want to talk to your lawyer about making sure that it's in the divorce decree that the kids get therapy. 
And you also want to make sure that they don't have final say, because what I've seen the abuser do is, okay, fine. They'll go get therapy. And what they'll do is they'll find some therapist green straight out of school, term the heck out of them and twist the therapy to their suit their needs. So what can you do if your child has been already turned against you? Okay. Now here's where it gets sticky. This is a really sticky wicket. Now, Studies have shown, and I wanted to pull this up. Where is my ha 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 glasses? Because I can't read the small print. Oh my God. Okay. So, all right. Um, studies have shown over and over again that if the child spends less time with the aggressive parent, if they spend less time with the parent that's doing the alienation, more time with the sane parent, that the hatred towards the sane parent goes away. Now, that's going to be difficult. Why? Because in our country, in this day and age, everything is 50-50. In order to get more than 50-50, several miracles would have to occur. There would have to be provable abuse, okay? There would have to be, you know, them giving up their time. Now, sometimes they will, and it just depends. So for example, I've got a couple of cases where the abuser left the state and started a new life with a new person, you know, new kids, the whole thing is pretty much left the first family alone. Huzzah, that's what you want. So, you know, the kids got more time with the other parent, realized that the other parent was lying to them in therapy, working on themselves, the relationship got better. Okay. So that's, that's the best case scenario. So what usually happens, though, is that the parent has got 50-50. So the kid is literally torn in two. It's, it's literally, oh, man. It's like they go to the abusive parent's house and they have to agree with everything the abuser is saying or they'll be punished. Oh, well, your father is this, your mother is this. And the kid has to go, uh-huh. And then they come home and they're angry. So they take it out on the same parent. And it takes about three days for the kid to kind of calm down and go, oh, I don't need to be taking this out on this person. I can calm down now. Everything's fine. And then by the time they're calm, it's time to go back to the abuser again. So the family court system needs a complete revamp, like total, like they're not listening. They're not they're because okay. the court system only cares about laws. That's all they care about. They truly do not give a flying rat's ass about the welfare of the children. They don't. They say they do. They don't. What they care about is getting you off their docket. They Each judge here in Maricopa County has got 800 cases on their docket at any one time, and they just want you to agree and get off their docket. That's all they care about. That's really all they want. They do not really, although some of them do, but dear Lord, the ones, the judges I like all retired, which really made me angry. Anyway, um, a few of them do take into consideration the personality stuff, but a lot of them don't because a lot of judges are personality disordered too. So they'll side with the aggressor. What a surprise. So the laws need to be changed and there needs to be parental alienation laws, making it a, a child abuse thing. Nobody I know of has got that on the books as a child abuse thing. The APA, my favorite people not in the DSM-5, it's not in there. And I don't think there's plans on it being in the next DSM either. There's nothing about narcissistic abuse in the DSM. There's about narcissism for sure and how they act, but there's nothing about how the survivors respond to that, like CPTSD, like narcissistic abuse syndrome, like, you know, don't get me started, parental alienation. Okay. So it's too late. You've already got me started and I'm just rolling with it. Um, so there is nothing in any of those to make a law about. So basically it's this symbiotic thing between the American Psychiatric Association and laws that, oh, if it's in the DSM, well, then we can make a law about it. Well, my suggestion would be you need to start writing the American Psychiatric Association and tell them they need to pull their heads out of their collective hind end and do something because so many children are being abused using parental alienation. And the long-term effects of this are horrific. So, okay. So get them into therapy. That's going to be your number one. Get a therapist who can help mitigate the mistaken thoughts and the mistaken beliefs that are being shoved onto them 
by the abuser. Okay. Now, the other thing I've seen, worst case scenario, I just gave you the best case scenario. Best case scenario is they lose interest, which a lot of them do, believe it or not. If it's, if it's their idea to leave and they've got another family and they want to go live happily ever after, ha ha, that never happens. And they leave you alone. Fantastic. Don't, here's where I see people going south. They're like, oh, but my children need their dad. Why? Or their mom. Why? It, it, if they're abusive, no, they don't. No, no, no. What they need is a sane parent. One singular sane parent. That's all they need. Seriously. So this whole fallacy of, oh, they need to be with their mom. They need to be with their dad. If their mom or dad is abusive to you, guess what? They're going to be abusive to the kids and pull your head out because that's what they're going to do. If they're doing it to you, they'll do it to the kids. So if they're leaving you alone, sweet, let sleeping dogs lie. Let them go off. And if the kids are feeling abandoned, you start explaining healthy, normal people don't abandon their children. And that's the truth. You know, my dad did that to my sister and my brother, you know, started a whole new family with my mom and then continued to argue with his ex-wife until the day he dropped dead because he was crazy. So, yeah, it's just, mm, I just don't even. Anyway, so worst case scenario is that they don't go away. This is their form of entertainment. This is their kokanya. This is their narcissistic supply. And they continue to argue with you and continue to argue with you and continue to argue with you and make sure they get every, you know, four, five, three, three, two, or whatever the split is, you know, for the 50, 50. Okay. There's a lot of them out there that do that too. So what can you do with that? So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to work really, really hard with your child when they come back, that they are not going to take out their anger towards their other parent onto you. It's fine that they're angry, but put it towards the right person. Who are you really mad at? Because I don't think it's me because you haven't seen me for a week. What's going on? Do you see where I'm going with that? So give them a journal, give them an outlet, help them express it. Let them know they're safe to talk to you. Now, here's the big thing. Stop taking it personally. These kids do not wake up in the morning and go, how can I make mom or dad really sad today? They don't. When they're over at the abuser's house, they're in survival mode. Guarantee it. If you energetically, if you could look at that poor little kid, they're probably like Zzzz, with the anxiety because they're trying to figure out how to play the game. The rules keep changing. And how do I stay safe? And how do I be loyal? Because, oh boy, loyalty is a big thing to them. And if they love mom or dad over here, they're being disloyal. And that causes a great deal of, you know, uh, disconnect and uh, cognitive dissonance. So the poor kid is just a mess, literally. So the best thing you can do is create a safe environment for when they get home, help them decompress. Help them write out what they're thinking and feeling. And do not read their journals. It's theirs. It's their private thing. If they find out you've been reading it, they'll never write in it again and you'll not know what's going on. The only time I would ever suggest looking at a journal is if the child's behavior is like suicidal ideation, self-harm, cutting, you know, then you may want to take a look at the journal. But other than that, give them some privacy because abusers don't believe in privacy. They don't believe in anyone having their own space because to them, everyone is an extension of them and therefore they have the right because they're entitled like nobody's business. So, okay. So you make a safe place for them. So when they come back, they can, you know, decompress kind of thing. So let's say that, okay, this has been going on. The child chooses the abuser and this happens. Okay. It's not always a happy ending. So the child chooses the abuser, the child goes off with the abuser, lives with the abuser, decides that you're the bad parent, they're much better because they have no rules. That's often what the abuser does. The abuser will do something like be a Disneyland mom or dad. Oh, well, there's no rules over here. You don't have to do homework. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to da, 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 da. So what kid is not going to go for that? And they know it. They, they know it. It's like the witch in Hansel and Gretel. You know, it's like, oh, come to this lovely candy house and I will give you candy and I will feed you candy. And what kid is going to say no to candy? Really? You know, they're not. They're not because, again, kids don't have the discernment. They don't have the cognitive, emotional experience or ability to recognize the kind of 
really sneaky, covert manipulation that the abusers are pulling on them. So the kids are not doing this on purpose, guys. They, they don't hate you. They don't. They just don't know that they don't. And then when they realize that they don't, it is heartbreaking. So worst case scenario, they go with the other parent and the other parent has them for years and pff, communication stops. That's often what happens. And sometimes I hate to break it to you. You may need to go no contact with your own child because it is so damaging. And it's just to the point where, you know, it's like every communication is just a damnation and there's no space to have a relationship. So you may need to go no contact. What I have seen happen though, is once the child matures and is out in the real world and off on their own and gets some therapy on their own, like it's their own idea, like I need therapy and they get with a good therapist, they suddenly start realizing, oh, wait, you know what? That's not normal. You know what? mom or dad really weren't the bad guy. What is what? And then the task of rebuilding the relationship starts. So what will happen in that case is the estranged child will reach out to the estranged parent and make that first little timid, you know, connection. And that's when you go, okay, I've been waiting for this. Great. Let's get into therapy together, family therapy together so that you and I can go through all of this stuff and work on it with a really good therapist. Best case scenario for the worst case scenario. Does that make sense? Worst case scenario for the worst case scenario is that they somehow stay connected to the abuser, don't get help, don't figure it out, don't ever reach out again. And that is a possibility. It is. That's why I'm saying if you want to stop that from happening, get them into therapy now. As soon as you know that you're in an abusive relationship and you've got kids, get them into therapy. Get them into therapy. And there's plenty of places that do low cost or free therapy. You just got to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Take advantage of places like Fresh Start Women's Resource Center. They can give you referrals to places that do things and that can help you. So Catholic Charities, uh, Jewish Family Services, um, some of the colleges, when they do their practicum, they have people that they need to practice on. So anyway, so parental alienation is child abuse, point blank. That's just, uh, I'm sorry, I've been doing this long enough and I've seen the results of it long enough to know that it's child abuse. It is child abuse. No state has a law saying it's child abuse because it's not in the DSM-5. So what needs to happen is everyone needs to write the American Psychiatric Association and tell them it needs to be in the DSM-5. Everyone needs to start contacting their, their state representative and senator and telling them that the family law system is outdated and it needs to be updated. And they need to take into consideration psychological issues like parental alienation. And this needs to be made illegal. It does. Because the abusers are just going to take advantage of the fact that there's no rule against it. Is it damaging? Yeah. Does it hurt kids? You bet. Can I prove it? You bet. I've got the studies to show it. Is the state doing anything about it? Not right now. Yay, Arizona. So, and, and right now it's incredibly difficult to prove parental alienation. So getting into the technical stuff of it, hang on. If you are going to accuse the abuser of parental alienation, you had better all your ducks in a row. You've got to have all your ducks in a row. You've got to have witnesses. You've got to have emails. Okay. Listen to me now. Believe me now. I'm not going to say believe me later. Believe me right the hell now. Get emails. Do not do any more communication. If you're separated from them, do not do any more communication through vocal, through phone. No, it's got to be something that you can take a screenshot of. It's got to be email. And the best is our family wizard because you can't erase those. You can't change those and those go to the court. So um, you want to show over and over and over and over again that they are the ones that are, because what I've seen them do is they'll claim that you're stopping them from seeing the kid when you've been over backwards to try to accommodate them and they keep going, oh, well, no, that weekend's not going to work. Oh, well, no, that weekend's not going to work. Oh, well, that's not going to work. I, da, da, da. You know, And then they'll be like, well, you're holding the kid away from me. But then what they'll do is when the kid, now this is also parental alienation and you need to be very good about documenting this. If you're supposed to have a weekly phone call or if you're supposed to be able to talk to your child during 
their visit with the other member of the, of the, you know, dysfunctional family thing, make sure that you're documenting it somehow if they prevent that from happening. Okay. I've seen them do that too. So they'll, you know, you'll be having a conversation with your child and all of a sudden, oh, well, that's long enough. And then they disconnect the call and it's been two minutes. Okay. Or they'll be like, well, this is my time. Well, you can call them when he's with me. Hello. You know, so it, you want to document, 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 get proof. And it's rigorous. Why? Because there's no law against it. It's not in the DSM-5. And lawyers are only going by what's the law, okay? That's that's what they go by. That's their, that's their realm of existence. And what lawyers need is absolute proof, okay? You've got to have witnesses that can say, yes, I was there. I heard this. This happened. Here's here's the here's the videotape of it, or whatever, whatever your state's rules are. In Arizona, I think it's still true. I'm not sure. Double check me on this. That as long as one party knows it's being uh, recorded, that it's that it's admissible, supposedly. But I don't know how the courts really feel about that. So, um, but you got to have your witnesses, and you've got to have evidence. So the the law system, the family law system, is all about evidence. And this is why most abusers try to do all of their nasty stuff on the phone because it's not being recorded usually. So this is why you want to go absolutely written form only. Okay. So hold on. Let me get to, oh, how are we doing on time? Oh dear Lord, I've gone over. Um, okay. So parental alienation, um, and this is on psychology today. So I, it was just, you just type in parental alienation psychology today, and this will pop up. Um, and it just basically gives you the rundown. Uh, parental alienation in the legal system. Parents can fight alienation in court, but they need to provide rigorous proof. A court may then mandate a reunification program in which the child spends time with the alienated parent under supervision to rebuild the relationship. Unfortunately, the, alien, the re reunification stuff also can be used by the abuser. If the child has decided they don't want to be with the abuser anymore, they'll scream that they're being parentally alienated and they'll try for a reunification, even though they're the ones that's been abusing the child. So you've got to be very careful. You've got to have your documentation. Um, all right. Treatment may also be provided to address the child's trauma. Uh, many relationships fractured by parental alienation can heal with time. And it's true. Um, it is a civil case. It is not a criminal case. It has not been declared abuse and it needs to be. Um, it's not listed as a disorder in the DSM-5. It could fall under ch parent-child relational problem, but that still doesn't label it as abuse and it needs to be labeled as abuse. Um, so anyway, that's a good article. Just put type in uh, parental alienation psychology today. That'll pop up. Um, and then identifying with the aggressor. So, uh, this is by Santiago Delboy, uh, MBA LCSW, and it's called aggressor and complex trauma, how we may need to become someone else to feel safe after childhood trauma. So that goes into what I was talking about is when the kid starts identifying with aggressor, takes up behaviors of the aggressor, behaves like the aggressor you know, that type of thing. Okay. Let me dive into the questions. Hold on. Okay. And I'm going to need my glasses again. All right. Um, do narcissists eventually trip up in their lives? Yes. I, yes. I have yet to see one that didn't get caught massively lying. But the way they got caught massively lying is that they were telling the court one thing, but all of the emails were showing another. That's why I'm saying do everything in text. It cannot be verbal. You can't prove verbal. You can't. It's, well, you know, I could say that you said blah, 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 blah. And they didn't say blah, 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 blah. You know, there's no proof. So the courts are very much, show me the proof. Where's your evidence? Where is your evidence? You know, you really... <laughs> You kind of think like law and order, you know, speaking of which, if you guys have not watched um, Resident Alien, I highly recommend it. Alan Tudyk is amazing. So funny. So anyway, where's the evidence? Okay, sorry. That's where my mind went. Law, law and order. And then he goes, um, anyway, so the point being is you got to have evidence. You cannot just say something. That's called hearsay. Hearsay is like, well, this person is just saying this. You need the proof. You need the evidence. 
multiple witnesses would consist as evidence because there's multiple witnesses. There's not just one. It's like, well, these three people are all here at the same time. And these people are not, you know, have nothing to gain by it kind of thing. So it does, it does go into consideration. You know, it's like witnesses are important, but what's the most important is hard physical evidence. Like, you know, they said this, it was written down, time stamped, date stamped, cannot deny it, cannot be erased. There it is. Our family wizard or some other form of email uh, court thing is what you need. You've got to have it in writing. So yes, they do get tripped up in their lies and they don't remember what they've lied about because they're so arrogant. The way a narcissist thinks, the way a dark triad thinks, okay, psychopath, which, you know, antisocial rules don't apply to them, right? The, the rules of the land don't apply to them. So they really firmly believe in magic thinking. And in their mind, they're always right. They're never wrong. And so they will tell a lie and retell a lie and retell the lie because their expectation is, is that everybody around them is going to believe them. And so when they get called on their lie, they blow up. They just, no, that's the truth, even though it's not, you know, and they do get caught because they're so arrogant. They forget that there's such a thing as, you know, evidence and, um, <clears throat> and, oh, gee, in this email, you said, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, it does, but it takes time guys. It's not going to happen overnight. So yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, one narc I knew was telling so many different lies. She eventually started mixing them up. Yep. That's what they do. And contradicting herself and even got confused. Oh my gosh. Yes. And it's because they can't remember what they've lied about. They seriously, it's like, they tell so many lies. It's like, it's that Megan Trainer's song. If your lips are moving, you're lying. You know, it's, it, that's what they do. And they lie to, uh, usually to, um, pump themselves up to make themselves look big or good or, you know, important or, you know, whatever. And they'll lie about the weirdest stuff. I mean, you know, it, it's funny. Cause it's like when somebody starts telling me lies like that, it's like that my little spidey sense is just like, this doesn't sound right. You know? And then doing a little investigation, it's like, Oh yeah, <laughs> they're lying. You know? So yeah, it's they, they, if their lips are moving, they are lying and they do eventually get caught if you're paying attention. And if you are, you know, kind of using critical thinking and logical thinking and going, well, wait a minute, you know, you said this, but now you're saying this, but you said this and that doesn't make sense to this, you know? So yep, eventually they do get caught in their lies. Absolutely. Okay. Do narcissistic parents alienate the other because they're jealous of the bond between their child and the other parent in part? Yes. But that's a very small part of it. Um, they're jealous of anybody having anything that they don't have. So if the dad and the child have a great relationship and the mother is the narcissist, oh, she will come unglued. Oh my God, the heinous things I've heard them say. Or if the mother and the child have a great relationship and the dad is the abuser, yeah, oh my God, the heinous things they will say. You have something that they don't. You have something that they will never have. Narcissists do not love in the way you and I love, okay? They don't experience it. They don't have that joie de vie. They don't have that happy for no apparent reason, like a dog going out and jumping through the grass and being happy. They don't have that, you know? They don't have gratitude. Don't get me started. They don't have happiness. They don't. And so when they see somebody having a truly intimate, happy, joyous relationship, they want to destroy it. How dare you? How dare you have something I don't have? How dare you? Seriously. And, huh. Anyway, getting back to the antisocial. So the rules of the land don't apply to them. And so they don't think that they have to worry about being caught in a lie because, well, it's, it's my right to lie. I, I have the right to lie. <laughs> it's this sense of entitlement. It's just crazy. So yeah, they're just heinous. I don't like them in case you didn't notice. I don't know if you noticed this or not. Um, okay. Uh, blah, 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 where did it go? Okay. Um, they start mixing them with content. Yes. Okay. Do narcissistic parents alienate the other because they're jealous of the bond? Yes. We talked about that. My narcissistic mom was very jealous of my dad 
and I spending time and she got angry. Who would get angry about the child having a good relationship with the other parent? That's not normal. That's also not sane. So a healthy, normal person, even if there was a divorce, because it happens, you know, here's the thing. You never hear about normal divorces because they're normal. You know, a couple realizes they don't belong together and maybe they've got kids. They do everything 50-50. They split everything 50-50. There's no recrimination. There's no anger. There's no uh, resentment. There's no, you know, oh, I'm going to get you. I'll get you, my pretty. You know, there's none of that BS, right? And so they share custody and they're amicable. And they're happy that each parent is raising their offspring to the best of their ability because that kid is going to grow up and be healthy and happy and survive and have their own children. That's healthy, happy, and normal. Yes, but we never hear about it because the divorces that we hear about, right, are the contentious ones, are the ones with the abusers who everything is a contest, guys. Everything is a contest with them. And they have to win. They have to destroy. They're kind of like, I know I'm going back to Resident Alien, but um, in Resident Alien, um, Ellen Tudyk's character is talking about the greys, right? And how the greys are just evil because all they want to do is destroy. They don't care about building things up. They just want to destroy. That's a narcissist. That is totally a narcissist is they just want to destroy because they can't have it. If they can't have it, nobody else can. And let me tell you something. If you've got a partner that ever says that to you, if I can't have you, nobody else can, you get a restraining order, you go get some pepper spray and you call the police and make sure you got somebody coming by your house because they're not kidding. Okay. Those are the dangerous ones. The ones that are like, if I can't have you, nobody else can blah, blah, blah. Those, those scare me because they're crazy. None of it good. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah, they will, let me go back to this. Oops, sorry, went to the wrong screen. Um, yeah, they're very jealous, very jealous. It's it's almost like when we were touring um, Alcatraz, this was years ago, they were talking about the prison food and how everything had to be exact because if one prisoner got even a tablespoon more of something, the other prisoner sitting across from them would come unglued. You have more than I do. And then a huge fight would break out. So, and that's common in a lot of prisons. And that's how narcissists think. It's like, well, if you have something I don't, rather than being happy for you, I'm going to destroy it because how dare you have something that I don't. So yeah, that is exactly what they do. Okay. I wanted to tell you guys about some appearances. I've added some appearances. So I wanted to let you know, so you can get your tickets. So, all right. Houston, Texas is going to be April 13th, Pensacola, Florida, April 20th. And this is on chrisgodinas.com. Charleston, South Carolina is going to be May 4th. Raleigh, North Carolina is going to be May 11th. Richmond, Virginia is going to be June 22nd. Washington, DC is July 20th. York, Pennsylvania, August 5th. Pen blah, blah. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania will be August 10th and Nashville, Tennessee is going to be August 17th. I'm so excited for that one. I want to see Nashville so badly. So anyway, if you want to get um, tickets or if you want to see where the dates are, just go to chrisgodinas.com, go to appearances. That's where that is. Next week, I want to talk more about these communal narcissists. I want to talk about the, the religious nuts, the ones that use religiosity to um, terrorize <laughs> their children, terrorize their spouse, et cetera, how they use that to justify and abuse cults. Basically, I want to talk about cults. So that is what we are going to talk about. I think I'm going to call it religiosity. So there that is, or cults, or yeah, yeah, something like that. Communal narcissist, communal religiosity. There we go. I like that. Anyway, um, so that is that. So, all right. I hope that answered your questions on um, parental alienation. It can be healed. It is going to take time and it's going to take getting them away from the abuser. It is no different than when you have a friend that's in a narcissistic relationship, an abusive relationship. It takes them getting away from it and really working on themselves to heal, to stop going back. And it's the same thing with the kids. The kids feel that, well, I love them and I hate them. And it's, it's heartbreaking because 
the abusers while they're abusing them, just like this woman in Utah that I was talking about, this blogger that was abusing her kids, she'd be beating him or starving him and telling him, I'm doing this because I love you. That is not love. And that's what abusers do to their kids. And it confuses the hell out of them. So it's going to take a lot of really good therapy, patience, not taking it personally, understanding the, the cognitive uh, things going on in the child and, and the siding with the aggressor, you know? So anyway, that is that, um, you guys have a great week, drink plenty of water. The weather is doing the Watusi again last week. It was beautiful. It was like in the eighties and today it's freezing cold and like 68. And I'm like, what the hell? Anyway, so you guys have a great week. Any other questions I did not get to, I will answer this week. I'm going to start doing little shorts, you know, the little 30 second minute thing. I don't know on uh, YouTube. So I'm going to start doing that as well. Um, so if you have questions, uh, you can leave them underneath the comments or you can PM me on Facebook or you can email me and um, I will answer it either in a short or in one of the little 10 minute videos that I've been doing. So you guys have a great week and I will talk to you later. Bye.